Hello, my name is Dr. James Shamia. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician and also Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the University of Tennessee Medical Center. This is now the sixth week that I've given you a COVID-19 update from the hospital perspective. And the slides I'm going to show you are a little bit different today because some of our focus has shifted. From a hospital perspective, we're seeing more patients in the intensive care unit than we did before. And what this means is there are sicker patients in regular hospital rooms, and many of these require transfer to the ICU. So while we still need to focus on hospitalizations and vaccination rates, we also need to focus on hospital resources like staff beds and equipment. What I want to do now is contrast the winter surge to the current surge uh, for our region. And our region is defined by all the counties at the bottom of that slide. And so you see in the 30 days that led to our winter peak in December and January, the rise in hospitalizations was gradual. And contrast that to what we've seen over the last 30 and quite frankly over the last 60 days where the rise has been much steeper. We have no reliable indicator at this point that that rise is slowing down. To put numbers to those last two graphs, we see that if we compare the current surge to the winter peak, we have 61 more patients in the hospital with COVID right now, 31 more in the ICU, and 33 more on the ventilator. So it is quite significantly different at this point. And as, and as I said, no reliable indication that it's getting better. So this is data from our medical center. You see that we have 164 COVID-19 patients in the hospital. This is actually down four from what we showed you last week. It's notable though that we've had 15 deaths in the last seven days in COVID-19 patients. So some of the fact that that number went down was related to mortalities. I'll touch on vaccination status on the next slide. On the lower right, you see that the ages are very similar to what they've been in the past. I wanna spend time going into a little more detail clarifying vaccination status. According to the CDC, you're fully vaccinated when you've had, uh, when you're two weeks after your second dose of a two dose series like Pfizer Moderna, or you're two weeks after a single dose vaccine like Johnson & Johnson. And so you see in the lower left, we've broken that down, 13% uh, fully vaccinated. And of the 87% that are not fully vaccinated, 6% are in process, they're just not complete and then 81% are not vaccinated. So you see still the vast majority are, have not started a vaccine series. Okay, so now I wanna to move to talking about ICU beds and ventilators. What I did here is I picked a date in July, July the 10th, where we had only five COVID-19 patients in the hospital and compared that to the 13th of September when we had 170. And you see I've shown ICU beds, how many COVID-19 patients we've had on the ventilator, how many patients who don't have COVID-19 that we have on a ventilator, and the percentage of total ICU beds. And this is really dramatic. What you see is that currently 70% of our ICU beds have patients on a ventilator. And in early July, that was only 36%. The reason why this is important, if, is a, if a patient's in the ICU on a ventilator and they survive, that they're expected to be in the ICU longer, in the hospital longer. It's a very resource intensive than patients who do not require a ventilator. And so that's something we're very much keeping our eye on as we're thinking about staffed ICU beds, staffed hospital beds, and other resources. So what are the downstream effects of having more and sicker ICU patients? Well, first of all, th there are definitely adequate ventilators at this point, but we have to remember all ventilators are not the same. Some are very complex, some are simple. They can't all do the same things. The next point is that critically ill patients are more likely to develop kidney failure and need dialysis. And what you hear about in the news when people talk about resources is almost entirely focused on ventilators. But dialysis machines are, can be very important as well. The, other, the next thing this means, and I mentioned this earlier, is that if you have this many patients in the ICU on ventilators or breathing machines, that means sicker patients are outside the ICU than normal. And this can create a domino effect. Essentially, everybody in the hospital is a little sicker than they would normally be. Also, due to the level of expertise needed, trying to staff and create additional ICU beds is much more difficult than staffing additional regular hospital beds. So now let's look at the non-ICU bed situation. And what I've shown here is just what, what is considered to be our general med, med surge or medical surgical beds and the percentage of those beds caring for COVID patients with COVID illness. 
and again, July the 10th compared to September 13th. And you see that we have 28% of those beds caring for patients with COVID-19. That's really notable when you think about this disease did not even exist two years ago. And so it's very important to realize that all those other patients who needed hospital, hospital care are still there. And we still have to find ways to take care of everyone. Before I close today, I'd like to make the public aware of a few things related to the monoclonal antibody outpatient treatment. Over the last seven days, hospitals have seen multiple changes in how they order and receive the monoclonal antibody. And quite frankly, we're not sure where this is going to land. There has been some concern about shipment delays and even some concern about whether the supply of the medication is going to continue to meet the very vigorous demand. And I mentioned this to you just so there's an awareness that certainly the healthcare providers in the community are committed to giving this treatment. But on a particular day, clearly, if we don't have the medication, we can't treat patients with it. So, so now to wrap up, uh, what I've gone through is that we're continuing to see uh, a lot of patients with COVID-19 in the hospital. And very specifically, we're seeing a significant demand of ICU beds and of those patients in the ICU, uh, a, a significant number of patients on the ventilator. I want to emphasize again what I've said in prior weeks. These type of issues, strain on hospitals, strain in the ICU, strain on emergency departments, affect all patients, not just patients with COVID-19. And so while it can be thought of as a hospital issue, it really is an evolving public health concern. There was a press conference yesterday of the medical leaders of all of the community health systems. And a lot of the point of that was asking for the community's assistance uh, because we all have this rising level of concern. And so the, way, the ways that the community can help us are what we've always closed these videos with, which are the steps to end the pandemic. Absolutely, please be vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you're sick, if you think you might, might possibly have COVID-19, please get tested. Keep your distance, wear a mask. As I've said many times, if you get vaccinated today, that protects you in several weeks. If you wear a mask today, it protects you today. Wash your hands regularly and clean frequently touched surfaces. Again, I appreciate and thank you for spending uh, these few minutes with us today and we'll update you next week.